All right, so we've talked in previous weeks about a study, uh, a course of lessons that uh, have been called Follow Me. And last week we were introduced to a new word, and that was transform. And we saw a video last week, we talked a little bit about that video, some of the things that were said. But now we're going to look into that a little bit deeper. And so, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open them to Scripture. I just read, and before the video started, it's found in Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verses four to seven. Here we read that God sent His Son, and His Son came to us to redeem us. His, his Son came into our lives to transform us. The word transform is a powerful word. Um, if you open your Bibles, there's many scriptures that we could look at this morning. The scripture says in verse 17, uh, if you open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So it's talking about a new beginning, a new life that we have in Jesus. And that new life is only possible because God came to us in the flesh. The story of Christmas is a story of God coming to us to save us and to transform our lives. The word transform is, again, if we study the, the history of that word, uh, we, look, we look at the word trans, which means to cross over, to overcome. To overcome and to become something formed is something new in function and shape. So the word transform means that God has come to us, to not just to help, but by His power and wisdom, He has now brought about a change. A change in us where we have crossed over and started something new with God. The old has passed away, and behold, we are new in Christ. God came to us so that we might receive His life. That's the word transform. And it's only possible because God has come to us. By His Spirit, we have been made the children of God. We've received the right to be called the children of God. Jesus earned what we have received. Does everyone follow that? The title children of God is not something we merited. It is not something that we deserve. It is all because Jesus came to us, God in the flesh, took our sins to the cross, died for us, was raised again, and by His promise of coming again, we have received a new life. And that's called transformation. Now, I would like to look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And so if you open your Bibles to Romans, the 12th chapter, in verse 2, again, this word transform is used. So if you have your Bibles, would you open it? Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2. Would you follow with me? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What does the word conform mean? Now, the C-O-N, it's always interesting to study words. The prefix, C-O-N, means together, to come together, to come to the same side, to join together as one, to match. So, form, again, is the same, the idea of shape, form, and function. Shape and function. So, the word conform means to come together in unity in the same function and shape. So, the idea is here, it says, do not conform any longer to this world, the pattern of this world, which means in the likeness of this world, do not become a unity, don't match yourself, your beliefs, your behavior, your thoughts, do not allow the world to conform to make you match this system of the world. The world is not to dictate who we are. But it goes on to say in verse 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a very powerful statement. By the renewing of your mind, we're to be transformed. How are we going to be transformed? 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is a work of God. In, where does it begin? In my mind. God begins the transformation process when he enters into my life and he begins to renew my mind. Everyone follow. So let's continue that thought. Open now to Matthew. And I want us to look into the sixth chapter. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus speaking here of the importance of what I bring into my mind. What I saturate my mind with. Now, I want you to think about this week. And I want you to hopefully... We all together do this exercise. I want you to keep track roughly of what time you spend, when, where, and how. It may be looking at your phone, watching videos, it may be playing at your computer, it may be at work, it may be this, it may be that. But make record of how, when, and where you spend your time during the week. Be honest with yourself. And at the close of this week, maybe next Saturday, I want you to look back at your diary and make note of how you spent your time, where, when, and how, what you allowed to penetrate your mind. What did you put in front of your eyes? What truly is captivating your life? What's controlling your life? All right? I think we all are surprised. Sometimes I had to do this exercise when I joined when I, my first job when I got out of school. At college was at Crocker & Gamble. And one of the exercises we had to do was to sit and write every day, log, even if it was going to the bathroom, and logging down your time spent, what you're doing, where you're doing, what you're focusing your mind on. And the illustration was how much more productive we could be if we focused our hearts and minds at Parker & Gamble on the things that we were asked to do as employees. Now the question is, as Christians, what am I allowing to penetrate and to saturate my mind? What is truly reigning in my life? Reigning, R-E-I-G-H-N-I-N-G. -I -I What's controlling me? What is truly the king of my life? We usually don't think of Jesus as the term king, but he is the king. And he is to be the ruler of my mind, the ruler of my life. But look at how much time you spend in all the different categories watching television, looking at your phone, looking at a computer, on and on it goes, eating, whatever it might be. Think about all the different things that you're involved in and keep a, ta to keep a table. And then notice how little time, or that's between you and God, because I can't answer for you and you can't answer for me, but let's be honest between us and God and look at how much time have I allowed God to penetrate my mind? That's extremely important. There's text I'd like to read on that subject, and it's found in Galatians, or Philippians, the fourth chapter, and look at verse 8 and 9. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 8 and 9. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses, verses 8 to 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Words that you should underline, words that you should live by. Again, what are you putting into your mind? If Jesus is going to transform my life, if he's going to be at work in my life, then I have to be very careful of what I am bringing into my mind. 
sometimes things that I need to put outside of my mind. Right? If I sit and watch pornography as a Christian, will that destroy me? It will. And Christians do it. If Christians have a problem with certain things, eat or drink, or whatever it might be, what should they do? Do they sit and look at it? You go, no. You ought to go to your house and get rid of it. And if places have it, stay away from it. The truth is, areas in your life that may control your life or influence you may be different than mine. Some people, I'm just using an example, could be gambling. I know some people's lives. I knew one particular man uh, when I was growing up. He literally gambled every every spare penny his family had. And he had a full-time job. He worked hard. But he would, he would start drinking. And when he did, he literally would gamble as much money playing poker and different things. He would literally spend every penny his family had. His wife had to hide it and keep it because she knew if he had it in his hands, he would spend it or waste it gambling. Now, I can't say I have that problem. I don't have any money. <laughs> that's not the case. But, you know, it's kind of the case. But anyway, the truth is that that's something that's never really attempted me. It's never seemed to be it's one of the few things. If I had a table of things that were never a weakness in my life, it's a small table. But that's one of them. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe gambling's in the form of going down a sled. Oh, that, I, that's true. That, you know, that, that's gambling in a sense, right? You, you start gambling when you do stupid things. And you gamble, am I going to live or not? That's the worst kind of gambling of all. But nevertheless, I'm trying to make a joke or something. Because you say, well, you're pushing on buttons in my life. I'm not trying to let God do that. Let God do that. But the truth is, you know where I'm going. Bring in things in your mind. So there's two things this week. Make a diary of how you spend your time, when, where, and what you do. Secondly, I want you to start practicing this new behavior if you're not doing it already. Bring into your mind the things that God wants in your mind. That's when God can truly transform your life. You say, God isn't doing much in my life. That's because... This is true. You're not bringing God in through your eyes and your ears. Saturate your mind, saturate your heart with the things that God wants to bring into your life. You have a barn. A farmer has a barn. He brings only the good produce into his barn, right? He don't bring in the weeds and the trash. Of course not. He brings in the things that are for his storehouse. The things that's going to make good food productive, right? As a Christian, I bring into my mind the things that belong in my storehouse. Those are the things God wants me to bring in. Good thoughts. What else? God's Word. Be careful what you watch on television. You need to be careful watching to Absolutely. I've talked to people in my family about that, and I'm not a perfect person, but I've learned from experience you can never convince me because I read God's word, what Jesus has said. He said about the lamp and the, how the eye is the light of the body. You can't sit there and watch. For example, I've seen movies that literally had, and I'm not going to use the uh, profanity word, but literally over 125 times a particular cuss word. Now the movie's 128 minutes long. And you think, well, that's all they said the whole movie, and practically it was. But, you know, if you sit and watch and take that into your mind, I guarantee the first thing that happens, you're driving down the road and you have an accident or you drop the milk at home or something happens that surprises you or angers you, you know the very first word that's going to come out of your, mark, out of your mind, into your mouth, it's going to be what you saturated your mind with. It's true. I know it's true. Right? And we're not going to talk about it. This is what Jesus said. I know by experience. If you saturate your mind with the things of this world, what will be in your mind? The things of this world. God can't transform you unless you bring God into your mind. That's what Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says. The renewing of your mind. Bring God in and let him control your mind. You'll start having different good thoughts. Right? 
you'll start having thoughts of peace and joy. There's a lot of people struggle with life, and it all begins in the mind. Right? You have a sick mind, you're going to have a sick life. It all begins. Victory belongs in the mind. That's where it starts. Right? And if, if, if things in this world or people in this world continually saturate your mind with things that you shouldn't be hearing or listening to, then you need to be careful how much time you spend in those certain audiences. Right? Okay. Jesus wants to transform our lives. Now, I want us to talk about some biblical principles here, and we need to move quickly. Please stop me if I'm, if I'm not clear. There are certain words in the Bible that's very important. What's this word that I read <laughs> vertically here? Can you read it? If I... <laughs> justification. Now, justification is a legal term. It's a legal term. And it talks about a person who was guilty being declared innocent or righteous or pardoned. The Bible shows it different ways. When I received Jesus, when I put my faith in the Lord, God justified me. Now, let's look at the text of this. If you'll look with me at Romans chapter 3. And there's many different verses we could look at, but we're just going to use one as an example. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Let's start at verse 22. Let's start at verse 22, but focus your mind on verse 24, okay? Beginning at verse 2, 22, Romans chapter 3. I don't know where you're going to be reading because I keep giving you different verses. Let's do it again. Romans. Chapter 3, verse 22. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. And are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We are justified. That is a legal term that means God has declared you Righteous in his sight because of his provision in Jesus Christ. Jesus on the cross took your penalty, the death that you and I deserve, and he willingly, lovingly, and obediently went to the cross and he died as a substitute for you and for me, such that in the court of God's law, he who is holy has declared the believer righteous, not because of their works of righteousness, but because Jesus, he himself, took our sin. Sin must be paid for. A holy God cannot overlook sin. God put our sin on his son, and Jesus suffered the wrath that we deserve, and he died on the cross. Therefore... By his resurrection, he has been raised again, demonstrating that our sins has been paid, the penalty has been erased, because what has been just has now been accomplished by Jesus, and God justifies the believer legally. It is though we have received the righteousness of Jesus, and he on the cross took our sins. It was a legal exchange. He died for me. And I have received his righteousness. Therefore, God who is just declares me holy in his sight, imputing to me forgiveness. My sins have been forgiven. I have now been in God's sight declared holy and just because Jesus took my place. Never think that God has overlooked our sins. God does not overlook our sins. Jesus took the horrible reality of our sin and died for all of it. That is why we have now been declared righteous in the sight of God, justified. Yes? Now that we have been declared justified, I stand before God, no longer guilty of sin, but righteous because of Jesus, 
And God has given me the guarantee of his righteousness by promising his spirit as a guarantee or a down payment on me. Follow with me. A down payment has been placed on you and me, the believer in Jesus. The down payment is his spirit. God sent his spirit into us, the believer, so that God has made a down payment on us. I recently, just as you know, purchased a new car. I put a down payment on that car. That down payment was my promise to pay off what remains. That car then was given to me. A title was issued in my name. That car, when you look up that license plate number, says belonging to Paul Adams. I put a deposit guaranteeing that I will pay for that car. God has put a guarantee, a down payment on us so that we are his finished transaction in Jesus Christ. Does everyone follow with me? His spirit has now been given to us so that God has set me apart for his use. I'm no longer a possession of this world. I'm no longer a possession of sin and death, but now I am a possession of God. That's what the word sanctify means. Does everyone understand that? Sanctify means to set apart for holy use, God's use. You've been sanctified. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were justified, and now God has sanctified you. You've been set apart for his use. Now, how is God going to use me? He's going to continually transform my life. How? By the renewing of my mind daily. That's called progressive sanctification. That's a big theological term. Progressive sanctification, just which means God is working on me daily to transform me into Jesus Christ, into his thoughts, into his behavior, into his conduct, into his faithfulness. All that Jesus is, God has called me to be. Everyone follow that? As a Christian, you have been called to be not only like Jesus, but Jesus is in you, and you have been called to live in him. The scripture goes on to say it this way, to live is Christ. To live is Christ, to die is gain. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, it says it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives within me. Jesus lives within me. And now God is transforming my life daily so that each day God is working in me so that I am being conformed, not to this world, but I'm being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Again, remember the word conform? To, to, it means to match something. C-O-N stands for, it's a prefix, which means to come together, to join together, to match. I have been called by God to conform to Jesus, to match Jesus' shape and function. I have been called in my mind, in my body, in my life, in my spirit, all that is within me, I have been called to become like Jesus Christ. And that's what it means to be sanctified. God has given me his spirit so that on the cross, I in my mind know that the old self has died and Jesus in his resurrection now lives in me and now I have the power that God in His Spirit lives in me. This is not some religious game or some kind of religious practice. This is a work of God transforming my life by power, by the changing of my mind. And then we talk about glorification. And if you open your Bibles, if you have them near Philippians... Notice what it says in the third chapter. Would you open to the third chapter and join with me as I read? Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, Philippians chapter 3, 
who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. God is going to glorify this body so that I will be completely mind, body, soul. I am going to be completely transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That is called glorification. And that is when Christ Jesus comes, and by His power, those who are dead in Christ, they will be raised incorruptible. Those who are alive and remain into His coming, we will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. Our bodies will now be changed. We will be glorified. And the work of God's sanctification is now done. He made a down payment on you. And when He comes again, He's going to finish it and it will be complete. We will stand before God in a glorious body, completely sanctified, completely changed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is the work of God. So when you say, is God still working on me? Indeed He is. He's transforming you. He's transforming your mind, your body, your life to be like Christ Jesus. Now, when we think about transformation, we talked about the importance of the branch concept. Does anybody remember that in John chapter 15? Remember the video from last week? David Platt talked about the text found in John chapter 15. The scripture says in verse 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit, and you prove to be my disciples. How is God glorified? When we prove that we are his disciples by bearing much fruit. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit last week. Which describes God living in us through Jesus Christ. When he is alive in us and we are obedient to his word, proclaiming his word, then we are going to bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit of God. And we talked about last week, we haven't been called to bear a little bit of Jesus but according to John chapter 5, verse 8, we glorify God when we bear what? Much fruit. He didn't call you to be a little tomato plant. He called you to be a big tomato plant, right? That's what he did. Jesus didn't call you to be a dead, withering branch. He calls you to be a branch full of leaves, full of fruit, so that you will prove you are his disciple. There shouldn't be any questions about it in your family, where you work, in your neighborhood. People ought to recognize by the fruit who you are in Jesus. The message you proclaim should only match the life that is within you. Ooh. Then we close with the sphere of influence. Now, I have this nice chart or this table in, in my teacher's edition. But I, I want to look at it because I think this is, is, is interesting. When God comes into my heart and life and he begins to transform me, there's different sphere of influences. I want to look at that just in closing. First, when Christ is in me, he begins to change my thoughts. How does he start changing me? Your thoughts. Anyone? I've done all the talking. Anyone? Do I have a different mind when Jesus comes into my life? Do I have a different thought process? Do I look at the world differently? Is that is that true? How? Anyone? An example? You start feeling bad for thoughts that you have of bad things. Yeah. You want to yell at somebody or something feel bad for you know, how you think about that person when you're mad in that situation. <clears throat> it, uh, as Cain chooses all the time, it grieves your soul. All right. Good. Uh, I have kind of a different example. When my dad was dying, I hadn't yet started coming to church, but now I look back and it's part of my testimony that I, I know God was uh, working on me because he allowed me to be grateful 
for so many blessings that I had that before I wouldn't have seen. I would have just saw the negativity of, you know, my dad being sick and dying, but in, instead I was appreciating time, the situations and things with him that I just know that's not, that's not where my thought on my own would have been at that time if, if I didn't, if God wasn't working on me. Good example. Good example. The way you see life is completely different. God begins to transform your thoughts. Any other good? I can, good. Yes. I can see definitely in group we talked about thoughts, behaviors, actions. That's kind of the process, mm -hmm. and I can see where just my thought processes and patterns have changed from. You know the things that I would desire to do or watch or who I'm around and my thoughts are more positive and more about peacemaking and just <coughs> I remember the word things that I read in the Bible and it'll come to mind in different situations where before it would have been a completely different thought and then that ends up leading me into a different behavior that's more positive and my actions are more positive so great thank you for the great comments anyone else Desires. So Christ in you, notice these spheres of influence. He influences our thoughts. How about my desires? Do they change? Yes. They change, right? Your desires change in life. Anyone with a good example? Anyone? My desires change. I desire to do more of what I know would please God versus this world or myself. And it's just completely different activities or things I would do throughout the day or even how I treat other people. I desire to help them more and be less concerned about myself, but be more concerned about what God wants me to do in all situations. Yeah, that's great. In my heart this year, as you know, I've, I've bored you with details. But here's a good example. I, there's many reasons that I like and am attracted uh, to Samantha. One has been always, I've always thought she was so pretty to me, beautiful, physically. But this year, after my accident, God really, I said to, the, to Landon and Samantha yesterday, God, he's, he's still working on me. Don't look at me and think that I'm a finished product. I'm a person filled with many faults and failures still. Just like you. More than you. And he's changing the way I desire my thoughts. And when I was broken, uh, literally broken this year, and I can't, I can't overemphasize broken. I literally, 100% was depending on people in around me, many of you. But Samantha was so important, critical to me, leaning on her, and I saw in her a better beauty that doesn't fade with time. And her helping me and just being there to support me when I was just very broken, right? So my desires changed, right? My attraction to her changed. Now, yes, still beautiful on the outside, but more importantly, I come to learn this year how much I can depend on her. That's a simple thing. Our desires change in life. You start seeing people, you ever see that goofy movie, uh, oh, what's a guy, he does a rock and roll movie, he did, uh, he's still alive, I know, probably my age, uh, what's his last name, Black, and he's in a refrigerator, he's in a refrigerator, he's in a, um, is it an escalator, I forget, he's, he's somewhere, and he comes in contact with that, that What's the guy's name? He used to be so very. Oh, I shouldn't have brought this up. This is horrible in a video. How boring it is. How stupid I am. Robbins. Yeah, Robbins. Thank you. Right? You know the movie, right? Jack and he Black. gives him the best gift possible. He starts Jack Black. He can only see people from their inside. Remember? And so, how it used to be so critical of girls and everything because he'd think they're ugly. He only wanted to talk to the girls physically who are pretty. And suddenly he starts seeing, and I think it's one of the fault row, wasn't it? And he sees her and this girl because her heart is so good. 
But you know, that's how we as Christians should live. Our desires change. We see the world differently, situations as Samantha described when her dad was passing, or we see people differently, right? I see the beauty in, uh, I'll use an example, Joyce. Her heart, you know, she came in this morning, I know her legs, and she's going through a lot physically. And I asked her how she was, and she just smiled at me and said, it's all good. Now, I know physically that's not true, but that's what she shared with me. I thought, I walked away and thought, what a beautiful person she is. That, you know, she, like me, I'd sit there and, well, let me begin. This phone's connected to this phone, and they all hurt, right? But she didn't do that. She put a smile on her face, and she just was beaming with joy. Let's keep going. We're, we're almost out of time. Our, thought, our desires change. Our will changes. What we fight for, what we're determined to do, what really are we striving to do in life, what's your objectives in life, that all changes. What is your will to do? I've always, as you know, been a boxing fan all my life. And actually did it for several years, but nevertheless, one boxer from the past, Rocky Marciano, you know his record, Land? You don't? His heavyweight record? Hmm. Well, I thought you knew everything. It was 49 and 0, right? He was a heavyweight boxer back in the 50s and so. He fought a guy named Archie Moore, and Archie Moore lost to him. He was beating practically the whole fight, if you ever see that fight. If you go back and watch these black and white fights, and I used to do that with my cousin when he was alive. But Archie Moore said this about Marciano, because he ended up losing. And Marciano, round after round, would come out and just beat on this man's arms. He wasn't hitting him in the face or anywhere. And he finally he just collapsed. And he said, what was different in Rocky, Rocky Marciano was? He said he willed himself on you. He came into that ring. And he knew nothing less he was going to win and he was going to do whatever it took to will himself on you and win. That was his will. Such determination. That, that's what made him 49 and 0. The point is, as Christians, our will changes, right? We've got a new will in life and we are to be God's determined family. We don't give up because of the situation or because of the illness, right? I look at Ann and I think of all the stories she's told us about things I know. Just briefly, I've met her at this church. and She's got a lot of stories and things that she's went through in life. But she's here today. And she's here cleaning at the church. We've got this beautiful building that's been clean. And she's doing a lot of things behind the scenes for this church. And I look at her and I see the beauty in her heart. But, you know, she could talk about past experiences and husbands and family and sons and all kinds of things. I just know a little bit about her life, but she's went through some very hard times. But she's got a strong will. It's God's will in her. You know? That's who we are to be. Our will changes in life. Let's keep going. Our relationships change in life. They change. Jesus taught us who are you to love? Well, the world says, scratch my, you, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But Jesus didn't teach that, right? He said, love your enemies. Relationships change. You start loving people that you never loved before. You start treating people differently. Your relationships change. You start having mercy on people, grace on people. Just as God had grace and mercy, and he still does on you. You are receiving God freely. We are to give God freely. Your relationships change. And finally, we close with this. The sphere of influence. God's transforming my life, my thoughts, my desires, my will, my relationships. What else does God change me? My purpose of living. You get new jobs. You get new, new things. But I tell you the truth, and I hope this never changes. The greatest thing that ever changed me. The greatest thing that ever changed me in life. I've had kids born, lovely people I'm with, that new jobs, things I'm grateful for. They're all gifts of God. But that evening in August of 1974, when God visited me, Bob Skirvin was preaching Jesus. And out there in that cornfield, in that little brick building, that church building, and 
God moved in the heart of that seven-year-old boy, and God saved my soul. God gave me a new purpose for living. And that's the greatest thing I've ever been given. I have failed in many ways, but I will never, ever regret what God did in my life when he moved in me. And since then, he's been transforming me. The only thing that's ever slowed that down is me. You're the only reason you'll ever, ever slow down in God's work. God won't. He'll do all that you ask him to do. The only, the greatest thing, the world can't slow God down. The only thing that can slow God down in your life is you and me. All right, so that's where we close. Next week, we, we move on to the next chapter. Thank you. Let's move on upstairs. <laughs>